Well, welcome, welcome to Hallelujah. all of you. Will you join us in worship? Stand on your feet. If you believe we serve a mighty God, put your hands together and worship God with us.
Good evening. My name is Yvonne Gentili, and I serve as Resurrection's Guest Experience and Event Management Lead Director. And on behalf of Church of the Resurrection and the Share Church team, I just want to welcome you to Leadership Institute 2021. We have a fantastic conference in store for you. We've got plenary sessions and workshops that we have designed to encourage and equip and inspire you to go back and do really fruitful ministry in your local context. We've been praying for you as we've prepared for this conference. And in fact, for our online participants, every person who is here in person received a card like this that has the names of five online attendees that we've asked them to be praying for while they're here. And so on this card, I have Michael Agnew, Stephen Brown, Donald Fishburne, Eddie Kreiss, and Tracy Harl. And I will be praying for you during this conference. But as we get started, will you pray with me? Let's pray. God, we're just so grateful to have an opportunity to gather together, to be here in person and online. And we know, God, that no matter where we're gathered, you are present with us. And so, God, we just ask that you would take these next couple of days and remove the distractions, allow us to focus and just soak in encouragement and inspiration, ideas and fellowship. Use this, God, we pray, to strengthen us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Oh, 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 oh,
Well, my name's Matt Beisel. I'm a pastor and a worship leader here at Church of the Resurrection. And as we continue in worship, lifting our voices up in song, let us now lift our voices in this call and response. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted. To God all glory, praise, and love be now and ever given by saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim release to the prisoners and recover sight to the blinded. To God all glory, praise, and love be now and forever given by saints below and saints above, the church, earth, and heaven. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to liberate the oppressed and comfort the mournful hearted. To God all glory, praise, and love be now and ever given by saints below and saints above, the church, earth, and heaven. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. for the stars and you lit up my heart because you move Holy Spirit move I've seen your words and I've felt your hand Faithful, faithful, your faithful love proves time and time again, Whoa. because you move, Holy Spirit. 
we close out this time of worship, I just invite you, let's just open up our hands and let's sing these words of the Wesley Covenant prayer as we offer ourselves and our lives to God before this time. Sing it with me. I am not, I am not mine, I'm yours. Sing, I am not mine, I am yours, God. So put me to your, your will alone, whether you whether you store, lay it aside, Lord. Enjoy or suffering, your grace be known. And I give myself, give myself to you. To your pleasure and your use.
kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, our Father in heaven, give us, say, give us each moment all that we need, and forgive us our sins as we forgive the ones that sin against us. Our Father in heaven, lead us not, say lead us not into temptation, but deliver us the enemy we are seeing. Yours Will you join me in thanking our musicians, our band, our choir, orchestra? Thank you so much. That was so powerful. Well, welcome. We're glad that you're here. My name is Adam Hamilton. I'm the senior pastor here at Church of the Resurrection, the founding pastor, and I'm so grateful that you're joining us in person. Last year, we did this to an empty room. This year, you are just a small fraction. You're about one out of five people who are joining us for Leadership Institute. So I'm going to look right in the camera and say, to all of you across the country and in other parts of the world who are joining us for Leadership Institute, welcome to you. We are so glad that you're here. And will you all join me in welcoming the folks who are joining us online? We're really grateful that you came. And we know some of you are, are doing this by yourself. Some of you are in watch parties of groups of 10 in various people's homes or in your churches. And wherever you are, thank you so much. Know that you're being prayed for by folks here at the Leadership Institute. I'm going to ask every one of you to take that paper home with you tonight to the hotel, wherever you're staying, to pray for those five people tonight, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, and Friday morning, to lift them up in prayer if you would please do that, and for the churches that they serve. Well, we really are very excited to be here with you, some of you in person, some of you online. I'd like to invite you to take notes, write down the things you want to remember and reflect upon. We're going to have a wonderful time together over these next couple of days. This is our 23rd Annual Leadership Institute, and every year our hope is the same. That is to inspire, to encourage, and equip you so that revival, renewal can happen in your hearts, in my heart, in our hearts together, and in the churches that we serve. And so that's our hope and prayer for what happens uh, over the next couple of days. I sent a survey out to, uh, to all of you last Friday. Not all of you read your email or you didn't take the time to respond, but enough of you did. We got a pretty good sampling. There was, I think, eight or 900 people who, who responded. And uh, typically, that's a pretty good sample. And I just want to share with you, we asked you, what are you hoping to get out of this year's Leadership Institute? And if you'll put this up on the screen, this is the word cloud from the responses that you gave. And I want us to notice uh, several of them that are here. First of all, I want us to notice uh, hope. 
Like these are, you know, big ones here. We're, we're concerned about our churches. We're looking for inspiration. We're interested in the future. We're hoping for ideas. All of these things are things that we're hoping that you come away with by the time you leave Leadership Institute on Friday afternoon. All right. I want us to think together for just a moment about uh, what we've been experiencing over the last year. And, uh, but before we do that, I want us to understand who's in the room and who's joining us online. So let me just share with you some data from that survey that helps us know who's, uh, who's joining this year's Leadership Institute. 44% of you are lead pastors, 12% of you are associate pastors, 19% are lay staff leaders, 20% are lay volunteers, and 5% are other. All right, so this is who's here. Let's see a little bit more about the size of your churches. So uh, the size of the congregations represented here, 13% of you come from churches from zero to 49, 27% 50 to 99, 29% 100 to 199, 20% 200 to 499, 7% 500 to 999, and 4% are coming from churches of 1,000 or more in worship attendance, and that is pre-COVID worship attendance. All right, let's take a look at what's happening. This is just basic information that you might find helpful. We wanted to know how many of you are back in your offices uh, for work uh, every week. And so if you put this back up on the screen, uh, we found that, that uh, 60% of you are back in your offices for uh, your regularly scheduled work, work hours. 35% are on a hybrid schedule and 5% are working from home. Here at Church of the Resurrection, uh, we have a similar kind of layout. Uh, some of our people are on, you know, on site regularly every day. Uh, some of our folks are working hybrid from home and back in the office. And some of our folks, very few, but a few, are still working primarily at home at this point. All right, we asked you about uh, what was happening in terms of your offerings, and I wanted to have a chance, you know, I thought this would be helpful for you all to see how are you comparing with other churches. So, uh, so how does your current budget compare to pre-COVID? And uh, what we'll see here is that 37% said there's no change. Uh, 27% saw a 20% decrease in your, or less than 20% decrease in your offerings uh, so far this year. 9%, 20 to 39% decrease. 2% were down in the 40 to 59% decrease. Some of you saw an increase in your giving, uh, less than 20%, 16%, 3% were 20 to 39%, and then you can see these others, 40 to 59%, 60 to 99%, and 100% increase in budget. So, you know, some of us are having really great years, and some of us are struggling, and there's a lot of reason why many of our churches and church leaders are a little concerned right now, feeling a little anxious about what the future looks like for our congregations. Let's take a look at worship attendance. And so we asked, how does your combined worship attendance today compare to your pre-COVID attendance? So combined means you're online and you're in person, uh, whereas for many of you, you didn't have uh, online pre-COVID. So we're comparing, trying to compare apples to apples, our total attendance combined and, and in person versus what we had pre-COVID. And you can see that for many of our congregations, there's been a de decrease in worship attendance overall. 25% saw less than 20% decrease. 16% were 20 to 39%, 3%. Uh, were 40 to 59 percent. Some saw there was, you know, no change, 14 percent, but most of us saw some kind of change, and a, a lesser number of people, but some congregations saw an increase between their combined and their in-person, or their online and in-person. 16 percent saw 20 percent or more. This is 20 to 39 percent, 40 to 59 percent, 60 to 99 percent, and there are 3 percent of our churches here who saw 100 percent increase in worship attendance when you count online and, uh, and in-person. All right, so another question we asked was just about your own personal spiritual vitality. How are you doing through all of this spiritually? What is, have you grown spiritually? Have you, do you feel like you've stepped backwards? And you know, there are some of you who are lay people, some of you are clergy, some of you are staff members. So let's take a look and see what you said. And so your personal spiritual vitality, you can see that 21% was about the same. And uh, these folks said, my spiritual life has declined somewhat during this period of time. And uh, these folks said, my spiritual life has actually increased during this period of time. 1% said it was significantly more vibrant. And 1% uh, said it had declined significantly. And, you know, every one of you are somewhere on this chart, right? We know and have experienced these things uh, in our own spiritual lives during this season. And probably we've all been somewhere along this chart, different places along this chart, over the last year and a half, 19 months since our churches first closed due to COVID, at least in person. Finally, uh, we wanted to know what you were thinking about the future of the church and how you felt about the future of the church. And, and these were your options. I'm excited about what the future holds. I'm feeling okay about our congregation and its future. I'm feeling anxious about our congregation's future. And really, we were about one-third, one-third, one-third in each of these categories. And so some of us are anxious. Some of us are feeling okay. Some of us are feeling pretty excited about what the future may hold in our congregations. And I will tell you, uh, let me just let you guess. Uh, do you think the lay people or the clergy were more excited about what the future holds? 
right? The lay people tended towards, I'm excited, feeling pretty good. The clergy and staff, especially the clergy, tended to feel like I'm a little more anxious about what this future looks like. Now, before we jump into today's theme, into today's theme, which is uh, hyperpolarization, COVID, and the Lord's Prayer, uh, I want us to think together about what we've been through over these last 19 months. I mean, we all know this, but I just want to sort of tee up why we're feeling some of the things that we're feeling. So uh, I, want to, I want to start with what we learned this last year. Gallup released information that was disconcerting to many people, and that had to do with how many people are members of a local church. You heard this information in February, I think, or maybe it was March, and you can see this here. Church membership among U.S. adults, and, and now in 2020, that dipped to 47%. Back in 1940, it was 73%. It hit a high around 1950 of 76%. But we've seen a precipitous decline in people who claimed a membership in a local church during the last few years. And of course, that's also seen a, a rise in the people who consider themselves nuns, that they don't really have an affiliation with any uh, organization, although they consider themselves spiritual, generally not religious. 65% of Americans continue to claim a Christian faith. So even though only 47% say they're members of a church, 65% say that they are, um, they are Christian, they consider themselves Christians. All right, so pausing there for just a moment, this is something we've already been feeling. Right? Maybe not every one of you, but many of us have been feeling this. In Kansas City, when I first graduated from seminary in 1988, and I came to serve as an associate pastor before starting this church in 1990, you know, the church that I served had 300 people a Sunday. It's in a you know, great part of town here in Kansas City, and today I think they run 135 people a Sunday. And if you look across United Methodism in the greater Kansas City area, you're going to find that most of our churches, I'm going to say 15% have grown and are growing, but most of our churches are declining, and they've declined by half or more since 1990. And so I'm guessing that you've seen that, some of you have seen that in your congregations, some of you have seen that in other congregations in your annual conferences. So these, these aren't just statistics on a chart, these are people that we know of, we experience this in our local churches. All right, so, uh, so then in addition to the fact that there's already been this slow steady decline of church people and then an increase in the number of nuns, and of course along with that we find the folks who do go, do go to church are attending less frequently. So when we started Church of the Resurrection, our average you know, faithful member was here three times a month. And today, our average member is here, attending member is here 1.7 times a month. They still consider themselves faithful members of Church of the Resurrection. And they, if you ask them, how often are you here? They would tell you that they're here every Sunday. But see, we keep re records. We actually you know, enter in the database every Sunday based upon attendance. And pre-COVID, I mean, before this, we found 1.7 times per month was the average for our members. All right, so we're living in that period of time. So, so then we also know if you're in a mainline church and in some evangelical churches as well, but certainly the mainline churches, we've been in, div, you know, in, a, in mode of dividing and division and, and conflict over human sexuality for a number of years. And that's come to a head for United Methodists starting in, two, well, before 2019, but certainly at 2019's General Conference. And so, you know, we've felt this in our local churches. It didn't matter whether you were on the conservative side or the progressive side, there are people in your church who stand in a different place from where you are. And so we've all known you know, the, uh, the experience of division, people who are angry or upset or who left our church over these divisions. So you can see here in this chart, this is from the Gallup organization. This is 2021, 1997 to 2021, a U.S. support for same-sex marriage. And uh, so this, the question was, do you think marriages between same-sex couples should or should not be recognized by the law as valid with the same rights as traditional marriage? This isn't asking, do you want to have same-sex marriages in your church? It's just saying, do you support the idea in general? In 1987, 27% of the population. In 2020, it was 70% of the population. So we've seen that in our congregations, but at the same time, we also have the 30% in our congregations, or some of you are in places where you have the 30, you know, the 30% are those who support same-gender marriage, and 70% who say, I'm not really in favor of this. And so when your churches are divided, and, and there are very few churches in the main line that aren't divided in some way. They may be divided 85-15, they may be 60-40 or 55-45, but we're divided over a pretty significant issue, and that leads to, you know, as you're leading, you're trying to figure out, how do I lead people who are deeply divided about something and bring them together, right? And, and, and in the midst of, a, a, at least in the United Methodism, a denomination that is about to divide. All right, so then we think of politics. And some of you have seen these charts. This comes from the, uh, from the Pew Research Center. And uh, we've felt the political polarization in our country. In 1984, uh, this was the median Democrat was in this place right here uh, between consistently liberal over here and consistently conservative over here. And mainline Christians tend to be, you know, we tend to fall mostly in this category here, especially United Methodists who are known as be the people of the via media, the middle way. 
And so this works pretty well for us when we're like this or even more closely aligned. A median Republican was here. Now, this is what happened by 2017. And so the median Democrat is over here. They've shifted a little further to the left and the median Republican has shifted to the right, but the median Republican has also shifted. And look what happened to that group who's in the middle. Right? And so what we find is people are moving towards being consistently conservative or consistently liberal. Now look, there's a whole bunch of people who still are you know, towards the center right, on both sides, but we find that there is increasing division or polarization in our local congregations. How many of you have felt this somewhere in the last year or two? Okay, a better question is who has not? And I want to hear the answer as to why. Because the only way you didn't feel polarized in the last couple of years is if your congregation was 100% uh, Republican, or in January, uh, you know, November, December, January, 100% Democrat. And I don't know any congregations that are like that. Church of the Resurrection is divided. We asked the question uh, in a poll last year, and we found that 43% of our people were Republicans. This had shifted, actually, in the last few years. 43% of our people were Republicans, 39% were Democrats, and 15% were independents. More independents than we've ever had before. So it didn't matter what happened in the election. There was going to be some very unhappy campers. And it didn't matter what you said from the pulpit there were some people who were gonna think you were being too political or you weren't supporting their person or you were saying the wrong thing. And so we've all experienced that. If you're a preacher, a teacher, if you're a leader in your church, there were people who were mad at you unless you were just totally silent and you said nothing, which is hard to do sometimes when, you know, when we have things happening in our society, in our world where it feels like they need to be addressed. January 6th came, you know, and did you say anything? Did you not say anything? You were afraid to say something probably. There was a time you thought about saying something. You worked really hard to come up with just the right thing to say. And then you knew that no matter what you said, there was going to be a certain number of people who were going to leave. And, you know, I, I said stuff and on Facebook and other places, and suddenly there's 800 people who are at each other's throats on my Facebook page, you know, and it's like, and letters. You're too political. I'm leaving the church. You know, I can't believe that you're not on my side in this story. It's just so interesting to see the times in which we're living and trying to do ministry. Last year, America experienced the largest racial protests in half a century. Over 3,000 protests or marches in the U.S. ensued after George Floyd's murder. The deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and other African Americans, and the responses to these deaths continue to expose deep divides in America in terms of how we interpreted those deaths, how we understood them, what we thought ought to happen, whether we needed to be talking more about race or whether we needed to downplay that because really we're, we're moving in the right direction. I mean, these were the kind of things, whether we say black lives matter or all lives matter, Right? And you felt that in your local churches, I'm pretty sure. In, uh, in the Great Plains Annual Conference, Bishop Sines told me, uh, I think it was sometime last fall, he'd had more requests for new appointments of pastors by the end of July than he'd ever had, and maybe than they'd ever had in years and years and years and years. Now, the appointed season started July 1st. Right? By the end of July, people were asking for their new pastor to be sent somewhere else because they didn't like their new pastor after four weeks. Why didn't they like them? Because they were saying things that were hard and difficult. And you know, as a pastor, you have to screw up the courage to say those things because if you don't have to screw up the courage to say them, then you're probably alienating most of your people most of the time and they've already left and you've got a pretty small church left. So you're trying to figure out how do I speak into things that are hard and have some courage in doing it and at the same time figure out how I'm not just poking people in the eye, but I'm actually influencing people. And, and do I have all the facts? And do I understand all the issues clearly? We're going to hear more about that uh, over this next couple of days as well. So all of this is going on while we have COVID. <laughs> I mean, isn't that interesting? Like it's this perfect storm of things. And then COVID becomes a proxy for all of these other issues or really the deeper issue of just the political divide in our country. So now we're, now we're having political battles over whether you wear masks or not. I remember last year at Easter, you know, the president said everybody should not, this, not Easter 2020, uh, 2021, but Easter 2020, the president said people should go back to church for Easter. And they're like, yeah, I get, I'm getting notes from people like, you're going you're gonna to have church on Easter, right? I'm like, no, we're not. We have 30,000 people show up for Easter church and we're not going to do that. Well, that was a political decision then, right? And whether you require people to wear masks in church, you've felt all of this. You know all of these things that you've been experiencing. So the other day, we, we did massive vaccinations. We'll tell you more about that on, on uh, Friday. Uh, and, and COVID, uh, you know, testing out here, and, and it's available for you on the, in the parking lot if you need COVID testing while you're here. I mean, all of these kinds of things. And, and so in an Eno two or three weeks ago, you know, I said, look, I'm just going to reiterate, if you haven't been vaccinated, I, you know, I want to encourage you as, as an act of discipleship, to be vaccinated, to protect other people, unless you have some reason, some really good health reason why you can't. Now, this is about loving our neighbor. And, and anyway, uh, you know, we came to church on Saturday morning and somebody taken spray paint to the entryways of our parking lot. This is what was painted in the parking lot. Do you guys have that? You know, one says church of the vaccination and the other one says, I need a pastor, not a doctor. I'm out of here or I'm out. 
And so I'm thinking, okay, that's really interesting. Who takes a can of spray paint and, and sprays the church parking lot because they're mad about vaccinations and masks? Like there's something more that's going on here, right? There are places, you know, Paul talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And, you know, and there are moments where you just think there's something spiritual that's going on in the middle of all of this. And so it's been a challenging time to be the church and to be a leader of the church. It's been hard sometimes, and you've gotten nasty letters, and I've gotten nasty letters, and you've had people leave the church, and I've had people leave the church, and we've had it. And at the same time, we're in the midst of this period where the world needs the church more than ever, right? You felt that, like, oh my gosh, what opportunities were here for us to be the church in the community, for us to serve people, you know? And even though our doors, uh, this is what was fascinating, the last year and a half, you felt it too. I mean, I'm just telling you stuff you already were doing. But over the last year and a half, we did more ministry in the community than we ever have. And most of that year and a half, we were, the doors were locked to the building, which reminds me of something that we've said often around here. When the building burns down and the preacher leaves town, what you have left is the church, right? So we got to be the body of Christ. Jesus didn't sit in a, in a synagogue somewhere. You know, Matthew 9 tells us that he went out to where the people were. He went through all the towns and villages and he healed the sick and he preached the good news of the kingdom and he cast out demons, Right? And, and so we were doing that this last year. How awesome to get to be the church in, in such a time as this. And the more we were involved in serving the community, the more we called other people to serve in the community, the more our people felt like, you know, this is our moment. And, and often the more they gave and the more of their time they gave in order to serve. But it was hard. So we asked you a little mental health question. We just asked you how you were doing just emotionally. And let me just see here. Uh, I'm missing one of the charts. All right, let me just show you. The last 18 months, let me see if I have another one here. Nope. All right. So the last 18 months have included not only COVID, but also, a this was the question, a divisive election, divisions over masks, protests, racial injustice, denominational divisions, and more. How are you personally doing? Check all that apply. All right. So I want you to notice that the, uh, that the orange is the lead pastors right here. And then the yellow are the associate pastors. And the green are staff people, lay staff people. And the red are lay volunteers. All right. So I'm doing well and feeling excited about ministry. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, we're about 20%. I'm feeling okay and somewhat optimistic. And you can see that the pastors are at 41%, and the lay staff and lay leaders are at 52 and 50%. So we're starting to see the pastors declining a little bit. Then, then we see I'm, emo I'm feeling emotionally and physically, uh, emotionally and or physically exhausted. 56 and 58% of the pastors, 50% of the staff members, only 24% of the lay people. They're like, hey, this is, you know, it's going pretty well. And I'm sharing that with you because if you are a lay person in your local church, I want you to be thinking about the staff members of your church and your pastors because they are feeling at least half of them, some more emotionally and physically exhausted right now and need a little cheerleading and a little tender loving care. I'm feeling depressed or dismayed. You know, the lay people doing pretty well here. Pastors and staff, nine to 11%. I'm worried about the future of our congregation. Now here, the lay people are jumped up. And, but still, about 30% of us saying we're worried about the future of our congregation. I'm considering retirement or stepping down from my role. 19% of associate pastors, 14% of senior pastors, 12% of staff, only 4%. Thank you, lay people, for not being willing to consider stepping down from your role. We need you right now. All right, so this gives you a little sense of where we are, right? And you all are, you know, you're in different places, but you kind of get a sense of maybe you're, you know, at the top of that heap and you're doing really great, but there's somebody else from your church on the staff or on your team who's thinking about quitting right now or feeling beat up and ready to give up. And that's true for those of you online as well, I know. And so what we're gonna do, we're hoping to encourage, inspire, and equip you. And we hope to give you some hope while we're here. And what I thought we'd do tonight is we would focus on the Lord's Prayer in the midst of hyperpolarization and COVID. Because I think at times like this, we go back to the basics. We go back to the things that are really essential and bedrock for us. Do you realize the first passage of scripture that most Christians ever memorized was the Lord's Prayer? It comes right from the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. You may not have realized or thought about it, but as a little child, you were memorizing Scripture when you learned to say the Lord's Prayer. And, and you know, I don't know who taught you the Lord's Prayer. You might just think about that for a moment. Who taught you the Lord's Prayer? In fact, why don't you, why don't you holler it out in this room? One, two, three. It sounds like the day of Pentecost in here. That's great. Okay, so I want to show you the woman who taught me the Lord's Prayer. And that's my grandmother, and that's me when I was one year old, not even a year old. And my grandmother, Sarah, was a faithful Roman Catholic woman, and she was determined to make sure that I knew Jesus. And she taught me to pray the Lord's Prayer when I was probably seven or eight years old. 
And then it was reinforced for me when I went to church every Sunday. We started going to church when I was uh, probably eight or nine years old, and every Sunday they would say it in church. We only went a couple times a month, but, you know, it got ingrained in my mind. I didn't understand it, but at least I knew this prayer, and it would sustain me. So I want us to think together because I believe that this might be a tool for all of us to go back to our congregations and say, hey, let's look at something really bedrock and basic, and it might just help unify our congregations, help us remember who we are and what it means to follow Christ. And I just want to remind you, Jesus prayed a lot in the New Testament, and we hear some of his prayers, but only one time did he say, pray like this, or use this as the pattern for your prayer. He didn't say that about anything else. Some people call the, the prayer that the tax, or the tax collector play, prayed in the sinner in the tax collector parable, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, the Jesus prayer, but he didn't tell everybody to pray that prayer, although it's a great prayer to pray. He did tell us to pray this prayer. So in Luke's gospel, it appears in two gospels, Luke and Matthew's gospel. In Luke's gospel, chapter 11, we read, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus told them, when you pray, say. He didn't say, you know, pray like this. In Luke's gospel, he says, say these words. And in Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 7 and following, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, when you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. He's saying, you know, you don't have to pray tons and tons of words. You can pray something as simple as this. He says, don't be like them because your father in heaven knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this, our father who is in heaven. So we find the Lord's Prayer appearing in the Gospels. We also find it in one of the earliest documents of Christian faith outside of the New Testament. It was called the Didache. It was discovered in the 1800s. Many of you have read it. It's a fascinating little book you can read online. But it appears to have come from the last decades of the first century or maybe the first decades of the second century. And it just describes how Christians practice their faith in that period of time. And when it comes to uh, the Lord's Prayer, it records the Lord's Prayer as we have it in Matthew, along with the doxology that wasn't originally in Matthew's gospel, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. That shows up in the Didache. And it says, pray this three times every day. That's fascinating. That in the early church, as early as the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century, Christians were praying the Lord's Prayer three times a day. There were three times of prayer. There was morning, noon, and afternoon, or evening that the Jewish people had prayed. The Christians adopted the same order of prayer. And three times a day, they would pray this prayer. I'm guessing that for most of your church members, most of us, we pray the Lord's Prayer. How many of you pray the Lord's Prayer at church every Sunday? So almost all of us do in the mainline traditions. So uh, we pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, but I'm guessing few of your members pray it during the week. And I don't know about you, but many times I have prayed the Lord's Prayer thinking about what I'm gonna have for lunch while I'm saying the words. Like I don't, I just totally, I, I said them like a horse that knows the way, the path to the watering hole, but without actually fully engaging. And what I'm gonna to suggest to you is that if we really engage this prayer, we dig into it, we're gonna find there is so much here that can shape our lives. And I think that was Jesus' intent, that this prayer shape our lives, our identity and our lives. So I want us to think carefully about some of these ideas in the Lord's Prayer. Um, and, and I, I wanna, just by setting this up, all of you who are pastors have had this experience, but we have an event here uh, once a month. It's a worship service for those who have lost their memories. So the area care centers bring people here who are in their Alzheimer's and dementia units. These are the buses that show up in the parking lot on those days. And, uh, and we have a wonderful team of volunteers, and they usher people into the, into the Wesley Covenant Chapel. This is a picture of the service taking place, and I love all these walkers and wheelchairs. And, and we, we sing old songs, you know, that come from the old Cokesbury hymnal. Some of you remember that. And, and, and you know, pop so, you know, songs that were popular from musicals back in the 1930s and 1940s. And... and uh, these are people, many of whom don't remember their own names. And some of them can't talk anymore. But when we say the Lord's Prayer, what do they do? They all begin to say it, right? It's etched in their neural pathways, right? It has shaped their lives. So let's pause for a moment here, and let's just say the Lord's Prayer together. And uh, you, if you need the words, they're on the screen, but otherwise, once you close your eyes, and let's just say it slowly and methodically. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. 
I write. In the time that remains, we're going to unpack these words together and try to understand what they mean. And I'm going to give you just a taste of what's included in a book that you all received a pre-release copy of as you came here. And if you're online, you should have received a link so that you can download this book yourself. I wanted you to have an early copy. It doesn't come out until December. But I'm going to unpack at least a bit of what you'd find in the book. The book will go into much more detail. But, but I want to begin by recognizing that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer for evangelism and Christian discipleship. So when it comes to evangelism, you know, this is one thing that most people in America who have been in a church in the past, even though if they're unchurched today, they know this prayer. So I was watching Ted Lasso. We're going to talk about Ted Lasso on Friday. How many of you have watched Ted Lasso? Okay, some of you have. So we're going to talk about that on Friday. But I was watching Ted Lasso last Friday's uh, 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 episode. Any of you saw it? Okay, it was about a funeral that was taking place. And at the funeral, you know, all of these, most of them, you get a sense, none of these people go to church. But what did they do in the middle of the funeral? Do you remember? Well, they sang, and then they prayed the Lord's Prayer. So I, I think about, I did a wedding in uh, Seattle in the Puget Sound recently. A, a, a high school friend of mine and, and LaVon's asked, you know, could you come do my wedding? And so I was happy to do that. And we went, and we had this beautiful beach wedding as the sun was setting. This is a picture of the wedding. And uh, I think we have it. Or maybe not. Um, no? wedding photo on the beach. There it is right there. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, I'm doing this wedding on the beach and, and I asked my friends, I said, uh, you know, I know most of your friends don't go to church. In fact, you know, one of the families who was there introduced me to their children and they said, this is, uh, this is Carney and Ernie's pastor. And the kids said they were like 10 years old. They said, what's a pastor? I thought it was really interesting. You know, I mean, in Seattle, you're talking about a lot of people who are not going to church anymore. Some of you may be from Seattle. So, so, you know, my assumption was that, that most of the friends there, T Kim and Ernie, they, they come from a Christian background and, uh, and they have faith, but they're not involved in a church. And I said, okay, do you, do you, like, do you need me to go like all secular or, you know, I'm a pastor, so is it okay if I like do a more pastoral, pastoral kind of wedding? They said, no, 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 go ahead and do the whole thing, you know, scripture, whatever you want to do. I'm like, okay, great. So, uh, you know, so I had fun doing this and, and trying to connect with these non-religious and nominally religious people, not being churchy about it, but just being real and authentic. And, and then after the message, um, I, you know, we said the vows and then I had them place their hands on my Bible and I laid my hands on, on their hands and I prayed for them that prayer of ordination to be husband and wife. And at the end of that, I said, now any of you here, if you remember these words, why don't you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? And I was astounded, like 75% of the 100 people who were there joined me in the Lord's Prayer. And afterwards, these people came up to me like, this may have been the first time they had prayed in years. But you see, they felt a connection because they knew the words. And, and so, you know, I had people come up to me afterwards like, you know what, that meant so much. Your service meant so much. It was just, in that moment when you had us pray, like there, there was this beautiful evangelistic moment with the words that Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. And I'm gonna share with you tomorrow, I think it'll be tomorrow, uh, how I spent two years teaching my granddaughter, who's now seven years old, the Lord's Prayer. And for me, that was a really intentional way of trying to pour into her life as my grandmother did my life years and years ago. All right. Oh, by the way, here's a picture of, you know, I got to show you a picture of my granddaughter. So uh, that's Stella, and that's my wife, LaVon, and that's me, and we were up in Holland, Michigan, and, and, uh, and Stella, over the last two years, had an opportunity to learn the Lord's Prayer. All right, the last thing I want to say as we're preparing for this, you know, walk through the Lord's Prayer is a Latin phrase that if you're Episcopalian, you know it pretty well, it's ora et labora. And ora et labora means pray and work. And it's interpreted in different ways by different traditions, but here's how I interpret it. Pray and work means that, that when you pray, you don't just pray, but you get to work after you pray. And, and so, it, you know, when you think about how does God answer our prayers, how does God answer our prayers? And usually it's not by sending angels to miraculously intervene. God uses people. And often when we pray, we fix our heart on the thing that we're praying for, and that leads us to be more engaged in the very thing. So we're praying for somebody else, and we pick up the phone afterwards, and we call them to say, hey, what can I bring you for dinner tonight now that you're home from the hospital, right? This is how it works. We, you know, so if you understand that going into it, that, that Jesus isn't expecting us to pray, and then God's going to miraculously do it all. He's expecting us to pray, and then we're going to focus our attention on the things we pray for, and our hearts become shaped by our prayers. That's, I think, what Jesus had in mind with the Lord's Prayer. So the first phrase, of course, we have, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So let's just pause here for a moment. Our Father. All right, our Father. Jesus could have taught us, why don't you pray like this, My Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. But he didn't do that. He asked us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. And so what we find in the prayer is this prayer is about our, us, and we, not mine, my, and me. Right, this is really, really an important idea. 
So we're talking about hyperpolarization, where people, it's all about me and what I want and how I see the world. But when we pray our Father, we're recognizing that all those other people out there are also children of the living God, that we are together part of the family. You might be Republican or Democrat, you might be far right or far left, you might be whatever it is, but you're still part of the family. You still have the same father, even if you don't recognize it. The atheist, God is father to the atheist, even if the atheist doesn't recognize it or acknowledge it. And the Buddhist, and the Hindu, and the Muslim, and the Jew, and everyone else, they all belong to God. Ultimately, God is their father, whether they recognize it or not. So if I recognize that, and when I pray our father, I'm pausing to say, oh yeah, all those other people, including the people that irritate the daylights out of me, they're family too. He's their father too. Robert Putnam, Harvard research professor, author of the New York Times bestselling book, Bowling Alone, some of you read that a few years ago, recently wrote a a new book about American polarization. The book is called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. And he looked back over the last 130 years and he found, you know, we talk about how polarized we are and we're more polarized than ever. And he said, no, not so fast. 130 years ago, we were even more polarized or at least as polarized. And so it's fascinating. And, And he begins to study the polarization in 1880 and 1890, and and there were huge gaps between the rich and the poor, and there were gaps sociologically and and culturally and politically, all of these gaps. And then he he notices as he traces this, you know, over the next century, that we became less and less polarized, starting in the early 1900s, going up to the 1950s, 1960s, and then we began to become hyper-polarized again until today we're back where we were, or nearly where we were in the 1880s. I want to show you the chart that he developed that captures this. And this is the title of his book is The Upswing, and this is the upswing right here. So this is hyperpolarization down here and here. And then this is what happens starting in the 19, early 1900s over here, uh, climaxing in the 1950s and 1960s over here, and then beginning in the late 60s and going on to the present, we move into increased polarization. And, and what he's saying is, if we can figure out why this happened, maybe we can change this and we can become unpolarized. And so certainly two world wars played a role in this, right? When you have a common enemy and you're trying to defend yourself and people come together, unfortunately that hasn't worked very well for us in the last 30 years. I mean, even when we came together after 9-11, it only lasted about two months, right? And then we fell apart again. And COVID would have been a great opportunity for us to have a common enemy, but it didn't work out that way. So uh, what Putnam says though, is he calls this curve the uh, we-I-we curve. And using uh, software from Google, he began to analyze newspaper articles and and other things that were written in the public uh, domain from 1880 until the present time. And what he found was in the 1880s, there was a lot of I language. And and there was this idea of social Darwinianism, the survival of the fittest. And and so everybody pulls themselves up by their own bootstraps. And and, and then beginning in the 1920s, people began to talk about we instead of I. I reaching a sort of peak in the 1950s. Now, the 1950s weren't perfect. There were a lot of terrible things going on in the 1950s. But Americans were less polarized then as they were focused on we instead of I. And then what begins to happen in the 1970s is we move into the me generation again. And we come back to I. And so if you look at the data, just the raw data, you find that there's a lot more I instead of we going on. And so he asked the question, he was asked the question, so why, what changed and what, what caused that to happen? I found it fascinating. Here's a Harvard research professor. I don't know if he's even a Christian. But here's what he said is one of the key drivers of this was the church and the social gospel movement, which began, and this, this is not just in mainline churches, but evangelical churches too, that embrace this idea that the church was responsible for what happened in the world and that we should be an instrument of healing in the world. And so the church moved people's language in their congregations from I to we. And so the question is, might we do it again? And the prayer is all said in the plural. Because Jesus, I think, is trying to teach us it's got to be about us and our and we, not mine, my, and me. All right, our Father. We recognize that the word is challenging for many people, the exclusively male language for God. We recognize the cultural context in which Scripture emerges and we understand the, uh, the patriarchy. And at the same time, this is Jesus' primary, you know, the, the one word he uses more often for God than any other is Father. It describes an intimate relationship. And and so understanding the challenges of this word, I I think of Roberta Bondi's comments in her book on the Lord's Prayer. She said, I grew up in the 40s and 50s with a loving but authoritarian perfectionist father who left the family when I was 11. Like many other people, having transferred to God the Father all the pain I felt around my human father, I simply couldn't get past the father language of the prayer to reach God. I was hurting so much and so mistrustful of God. Okay, these are, there are people in your congregations where this is a true statement for them. And there are many of us whose relationships with our dads wasn't perfect. And so that left us feeling a little 
cautious about God and sometimes doubting whether God could be there for us. So I think, you know, Roberta substituted the language a parent, our parent who's in heaven, and I think that's okay. And sometimes there's mother language about God we find in Scripture, especially the idea of birth and God giving birth to us, which is what a woman does. And so we find this in Scripture as well. But I appreciated something Pope Francis said in his little book on the Lord's Prayer. He said this, when we address God as our Father, we, in, we are invited to remember that regardless of whether our human fathers loved us deeply or abandoned us entirely, or whether our fathers died or were simply absentee, none of us are orphans. I love that idea. There are no orphans. And for me, the word father has worked pretty well because as a dad, I love my girls more than I could, po- and if you have children, I suspect you feel the same, more than I could possibly express to you. And I've told them before, if, if you had a bad heart and you needed my heart, I would give it to you. I, wouldn't, I, I would hope I wouldn't have to think twice. You could have it, and I would die. I would, I would lay down my life for you. That is how much I love you. And that's how I feel about my granddaughter. And so it's easy for me to picture this when I think about God and the desire. You know, I want my kids, I want blessings for them, and I want good things for them, and I want to be with them all the time, and I want a relationship with them, and all those things describes what God is descri- or what Jesus is describing about God when he invites us to pray, our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here's the first petition in the prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Now, all of these petitions were actually, it's, it literally is in Greek, God, hallow your name. What does it mean to hallow God's name? It means to make it holy, to consider it you know, to consider it reverently. It means to consider God awesome or amazing or beautiful or powerful or holy. You know, take your pick, but it's, it's this, but what are we doing telling God to, to make his name holy? Is God's name not already holy? So here we remember again, ora et labora. Like we pray for God's name to be made holy and then we realize now I got to work to do that. Like I am somebody who's called by his name. You are his people called by his name. So what's your job? Your job is to hallow God's name in your daily living. What would happen if the people in our congregation prayed this prayer every day and said, today, Lord, help me to hallow your name in everything that I do, in the way that I talk, in the things that I think, in the, in the way that I conduct my business, help me to hallow your name. You see how this just shapes everything. We prayed that Wesley Covenant prayer a moment ago. You know, I am not my own, but thine. Put me to what you will. That's what we're praying when we say, hallowed be your name and use me to do it. Here's the next line. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Stanley Halraus and Will Willimon in their book on the Lord's Prayer note that precisely at this point, the prayer becomes political. Interesting. Uh, Willimon says this. He says uh, that that this is a turning point in the prayer when we say on earth as as it is in heaven. And they write, unexpectedly, quite surprisingly, politics has crept into our Christian praying at this point. And here's why. We're not just praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done to our individual hearts and lives. We're praying that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is not something that's pie in the sky that's going to happen someday when we die. It's something we pray for. And then Ora et Labora says, and we work for it here on earth. So when we're watching the news, in the midst of our political divides, you know, this is one thing we can all agree upon. Jesus told us to pray this way. So you're some of your Republicans, some of your Democrats, but we're all going to pray the same prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do you think God wants to have happen here on earth? On earth? You know, in our world with these problems that we're watching on the news, because we're all signing up to go do that when we pray this prayer. Uh, Last year, we had uh, Ron Heifetz here. He is at uh, Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government. And uh, and I showed you this chart. I've shared it multiple times because it's been meaningful to me. It's just so simple and basic. But it captures what Jesus was talking about in this prayer. Uh, Heifetz said, he's talking about leadership and what leaders do. And he said, you know, leaders analyze the world as it is. And then they look to see what is the world supposed to be like. And then their goal is to close the gap. Right? And so... When Jesus talked about the world as it's supposed to be, he called it the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, some of you and most of you during COVID, you looked around and said, okay, how can the church be the church right now? Who needs food? What do we do? Who needs blood supplies? What do we do to encourage hospital workers? How do we get involved, roll up our sleeves? Because we were praying and living this prayer, ora et labora. I also want you to notice here, and I love this, every time we say thy or thine, we're intentionally not saying my and mine. So this is why when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I always emphasize, I just give a punch to thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory, because I'm telling myself, not mine. No, not to me, but to you belongs the glory and the power and the kingdom is yours, the rule is yours, your will be done, not my will be done. I want to give you a picture of what that looks like. So James McGinnis is one of the most remarkable men that I know. He is uh, a young man in our congregation 
who in 2014 was playing football as a senior in high school at Olathe East High School, and he made a tackle. And when he did, he hit his head against some kid's hip and caused a uh, subdural hematoma. And I wanted you to hear from him a little bit of his story. Take a listen. Hey, Church of the Resurrection, I am really excited to be with you today. And again, during this summer, during my sabbatical, I'm introducing you to very interesting people. And the interesting person I'm inter introducing you to today, some of you have met before, James McGinnis, and he's here with his father, Patrick. And it was in September of 19, or excuse me, September of 2014, that you were playing football for Olathe, I can't remember which high school, Olathe North? East. Olathe East. And, uh, and on the field, you hit another player, your head, their hip. Yeah. And you ended up with a subdural hematoma. You were in a coma for several days. You were in the hospital for 18 days. And uh, no one was sure exactly what was going to happen after that. No. And uh, so t what, what's happened in the years since? Well, in the years since, I relearned to walk, talk, and pretty much make myself more independent. The thing that amazes me about you, James, and I've had the chance to watch you over these almost seven years now, your perseverance, your unwillingness to give up, but what, what really stands out to me is this. Yes. And so what, what does that mean? American Sign Language symbol for I love you. Anybody who knows you, the first thing they think is I love you. What does that mean for you and what are you trying to say to other people? It's honestly an honor to be known by that symbol. I'm just on a mission to make it everyone's goal, whether Christian, Catholic, Muslim, and whatever religion or non-religion you are, just to love one another and be kind, you know? I love that. The one thing that has been um, amazing to watch over the years is that, and he was like this in high school, but he, he is what I consider a bridger. And he would take people with different opinions, whether in high school, whether it's uh, people that were, uh, he was National Honor Society or band geeks or whatever, and he would find what was what they he had in common with them and build relationships with them. And, uh, and that is, continues today. And he's just trying to send the message that no matter what, love one another. Can I just tell you how amazing it is to watch this kid? Because wherever he goes, this is the first thing you see. This is how he greets people like this. And you see him do it at church, and you see him do it in the community, and his mission is to spread love. And, and, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, here's a kid who has everything going against him. Like he had to le relearn how to walk and talk, and, and he's never going to have the opportunity to have the kind of jobs many of you would have. But his mission is to bring love into a divided world. So his family was down in Joplin, Missouri, and uh, they were on their way back to Kansas City. They stopped in a gas station. It was, it was dark. It was, uh, you know, after, after dark. And, um, and they just finished filling up, and they got in the car, and they started to drive away, and a group of bikers uh, pulled in to get gas. And this was kind of a rough-looking group of people. And, and, uh, and James said to his dad, hey, Dad, wait for just a minute. James, like, his dad said, well, like, Patrick said, what? what, what? Well, no, just, just wait for a minute. So he kind of just waited, and these guys stopped and got off their bikes, and they, some were filling up with gas, and some were just hanging around, and they didn't look particularly friendly, and James says, I, I need to go talk to them. And Patrick's like, are you sure you need to go talk to them? Dad, I need to go talk to them. Okay. So uh, James walks up, and, uh, you know, he's walking towards the bikers, and they're like, and they look mad. Like, who is this kid who's coming to bother us right now? Like, you're not part of us. And he walked up. And he did this, and they're still like this. And then James began to talk, and they realized that he had some either a learning disability or there was some brain damage, and that lowered the walls completely when he walked up and started talking. And then he said, you know, this means I love you, and I just want you to know that you are loved. And one of these bikers starts to cry. And he says, you know, my dad never told me that as I was growing up. I never had anybody tell me that. And James says, well, I want you to know you were loved. 
I mean, it's just, this is one of a thousand stories of this kid who is a walking, living, breathing mission for Christ. And it's what it looks like when we believe thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes those are really big things that we do, and sometimes they're just showing up. And you know, it's precisely because of his disabilities that he has, a, he has a, a, an opening for people to listen to him. And this is his mission. You are loved. What would happen if that could be our mission as our churches? What could happen if our congregation members understood every day I wake up, I want to hallow God's name, and I want to see, I want to pray and act towards seeing God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to show love to and compassion to people who are Republicans and Democrats and people different from me and like me. Let's look at the next line. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. This is for some real food, right? And when we pray, give us this day uh, our daily bread, we remember that praying that, you know, and again, it's give us this day. It's not just me, but I'm praying for us. I'm praying that all of us have our daily bread when I pray this prayer. But Ora at Labora says, I can't just pray for other people to have food. I mean, you all have been in those prayers. You've even said those prayers. Oh, Lord, we, you know, thank you for this bountiful food that we're about to receive, and we remember those who are poor and in need. Great. James says, you know, it doesn't quite cut it when you pray for somebody who's in need and you don't go do something about it. So ora labora means I'm going to pray for us to have our daily bread, and then I'm going to recognize that I'm responsible for doing something to make sure that people have their daily bread. Now, this is such a simple thing, and we all do this. We have food drives at our churches, and, you know, at Church of the Resurrection, we've just said this is one of the major things that we're going to do. It's not the only thing. It's not even our biggest things, but it's one of the key things we're going to do in Kansas City is we're going to, we're going to do everything we can to be the answer to somebody else's prayer who's struggling in this way. And I just want to share with you, you know, this is a little bit of what we do in this video. And then one of our latest things we've done is we ordered, had built a mobile food pantry for the food deserts in Kansas City. I'm not going to suggest most of you do that. In fact, I don't think most people should do it. It's a kind of expensive thing to do. And we've got, we're going to use it a ton and it makes it worth it. But there are ways you could go in vans and do the same thing that we're going to do with this mobile food bus. You'll have the chance if you're here in Kansas City to see the mobile food bus Friday morning. It'll be here from, I think, 8.30 until 1. And I want you to take a tour of it. But, uh, but here's a little bit of our food ministry. Take a listen. Hi, I'm Michelle Van Pelt. I'm the program director for Local Missions, and I'm excited to share information with you about our hunger ministry. The Hunger Stoppers ministry is an overarching umbrella ministry with three distinct ministries under that umbrella. First, our pantry program. We support 28 pantries throughout the Kansas City area by providing monthly non-perishable food deliveries and funding supplements that enable them to provide fresh items. Our support is vital to their ability to continue to serve their communities. Year to date, we have delivered 130 34 tons of food. This program relies on a minimum of 30 volunteers each month to make this possible. Next, our food pantry at our Resurrection Overland Park campus sees over 100 families a week. It relies on donations and 40 volunteer positions to keep things running smoothly. And finally, I want to introduce you to our newest initiative in Feeding Kansas City. We will be launching the Food Mobile this month. We are answering a call to meet many of our most vulnerable populations exactly where they are. There are many fantastic organizations doing great work, and we don't want to interrupt that. Our goal with the Food Mobile is to fill in the gaps. We will be focused on communities that lack these resources or are in food deserts. The Food Mobile will provide access to nutritious food they currently don't have. Our 28-foot bus will be partnering with carefully selected sites to provide their communities with fresh proteins, produce, dairy, and non-perishables. We'll be rolling out our schedule in phases with phase one visiting four locations a week. And as you can imagine, this is a tremendous undertaking, and it's essential that we have your financial and volunteer support to make this successful. All information about our Hunger Stoppers ministry can be found at core.org slash hunger. Last week, the last <clears throat> three weeks, we had these sacks available at every one of the doors, and I preached into it and just said, you know, this is your chance to take a sack or two or three or five and to fill it with groceries, and then I want you to bring it back, and I want you to pray a blessing over the meal as you bring it back. I want you to pray for the children and the families who are going to be eating this food at 34 area food pantries that you're supplying. We're the largest source of food in the greater Kansas City area, aside from harvesters. And, um, and so you give them the tools. You all do this kind of stuff all the time. But for us, we do this three times a year, 1,500 backpacks every Friday for kids in area schools who uh, don't have enough to eat. During COVID, when they weren't going to school, getting their free breakfast and lunch programs, we were taking food to where these kids were. And here's what I find is Republicans love this program. Democrats love this program. Trump supporters like this program. Biden supporters like this program. And people who normally don't like each other suddenly like each other when they're working together to provide for the needs of people when we're answering the prayer that we're praying, or at Labora. By the way, we're not only praying for the physically hungry, because most of us don't have to worry about where our next meal comes from. The Greek word in uh, Matthew's gospel for daily is epiousion, 
usian, you may remember that word from theology school, uh, usian, homo usian, uh, tu patri, that is uh, a one substance with the Father, right? Uh, daily bread here is upon substance. What is it that brings substance or, or being to you? And so for many of us, it's not food, not the kind we eat, but instead we remember what Jesus said after he fed the multitudes. He said, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never go hungry. And so we're praying, God, fill me up. Be the bread of life for me when we pray this prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We're almost done. So we are constantly sinning against each other and against God, right? Paul says it this way, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We Christians are great at this. Everybody's great at it. It's a part of our problem, right? Paul Tillich said this though, forgiveness is the answer, the divine answer to the question implied by our existence. I love that quote. And the Greek word for forgiveness in, or uh, forgive in the, in the Lord's Prayer is ephi amy. Ephi amy, I may be mispronouncing that. It means to release or let go, right? So somebody has a, de- you know, somebody owes you a debt. They did something wrong. They hurt you. They owe you something for that. This is the idea. And when you offend God, you do something you, to sin against God, you owe God something, a sacrifice or something, right? And what we're asking for is for God to release us from all the debt that we owe God. And what God you know, is asking of us, what Jesus is asking of us is that we release other people. I mean, this prayer is a really scary part of the prayer, right? Forgive us our trespassers, what? As we forgive those who trespass. Forgive me to the same degree that I'm willing to forgive other people. Now, right now we live in a world where there's a lot of hurt and a lot of anger and a lot of resentment and a lot of bitterness from people, right? And this prayer is inviting us to forgive other people. Sometimes it's our parents because they didn't see things the way we saw them. And sometimes it's our kids who frustrate the daylights out of us and hurt us, right? And so along the way, this prayer is about healing every kind of relationship that we have. First, our relationship with God, but what God knows is that this world only functions if we forgive each other, if we have grace. So some of you have seen this before. I, have a, I wrote a book years ago on forgiveness, and this was the metaphor I used throughout the sermon series. Is, you know, we have, I, I talked about these rocks as sort of the bitterness and the irritation and frustration that we feel when people sin against us. And there's a lot of small things that people do, little slights, and every day you know, we do these to each other and other people do this to us. And so you know, we, we have these things that we either let them go or we pack them in the backpack of our hearts and we just carry them around with us. And then, of course, there are more serious kinds of sins, you know, the, the kinds of places where people do things and that really does hurt us. And maybe they were intentional, maybe they weren't intentional, but they're not just little tiny slights. And, and across the, you know, they might not happen all the time, but, you know, across the course of your life, you've got a lot of places where your mom and your dad hurt you or your grandparents or an uncle or aunt or a school teacher or somebody who used to be your friend and they, and they, uh, they betrayed a confidence. And, and so we've, we've got all of these places where we find ourselves feeling hurt by things that are really hard to let go of. They're just not so easy to, to just let them go. And then there are these really big things that happen sometimes, right? Like somebody fired us without right cause, or our spouse cheated on us or left, or our kids won't talk to us anymore, or somebody took the life of somebody that we love. And then we pack these things in our hearts and we just carry them. And we keep carrying them. And we try to do life this way. You know, even preachers, you know, we try to preach even though we're carrying bitterness in our hearts. I've had this towards parishioners and I have to look out and see them when I'm preaching my sermon about forgiveness, right? But I can't quite forgive that person. And so we carry it with us. Right, and the more we carry it with us, like, I, I don't know, you can tell, but I, I'm out of breath right now already. Because <laughs> it's about 50 pounds of rocks I'm pulling around on my back. And you can't dance like this, and you can't jump, and you can't really laugh, and you can't do the kinds of things you're supposed to do because you're carrying around all this bitterness in your heart, all this resentment. And so what Jesus is saying is, you know, if you want God to let it go, you're gonna have to <laughs> let it go. That's what he's calling us to do. You know, Jesus talks a lot about forgiveness. He's constantly forgiving other people their sins, reminding them that God is a God of mercy and grace and he longs to forgive your sins. He's more ready to to forgive you than you are to ask. As far as the east is from the west, the psalmist says. But you gotta be willing to forgive too. And so when we preach this, when we teach this, like we're calling people to forgiveness. And, And when they pray this prayer, maybe they don't pray it three times a day, but what if your people didn't pray it only on Sunday? 
What if every day they prayed this prayer and it began to shape their lives? How would our country be different if all Christians in America prayed this prayer every day and it actually shaped their lives when it came to forgiveness and mercy and grace? This spring we had a remarkable man speak here at Church of the Resurrection. Um, Mindy Corcoran is one of our members who lost both her father and her son in a shooting at the Jewish Community Center on Palm Sunday several years ago. And in response to that, she formed seven days, which is uh, a week of kindness. And then she began looking at ways to build bridges because this was a man who'd been a part of the KKK in South Missouri, had been a leader there and, and spewed hate his whole life. And he came to Kansas City to kill Jews and he drove to the Jewish Community Center where he thought he'd kill Jews. And instead there was two of my members who were going to a, to a recital that afternoon, a rehearsal for a, a talent show, and he came up at point blank, blank range and killed the grandfather, Dr. William Corcoran, and then he killed his grandson, Reed Underwood. And then he went to the Jewish uh, Senior Living Center down the street, uh, Shalom Village, and he killed the first woman who walked out the door, who happened to be a Catholic woman going to visit her mother, who was the aunt of one of our members, or one of our staff members. When he was arrested, he put up the Heil Hitler sign from the police car. And she was determined to live out Romans chapter 12, verse 21, that says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Anyway, she, she, had a, she has a, a series of speakers that come every year uh, to, uh, to speak in the Kansas City area, and this one was Dr. Abulish, Isildine Abulish. And I wanna tell you just a little bit about him. He was born and raised in the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. He received his medical doctorate at the University of Cairo, earned a diploma in obstetrics and gynecology from the University of London. He completed his residency at Soroka Medical Center in Israel and earned a master of divinity degree, or master's degree, not divinity, in public health from Harvard. He was the first Palestinian to practice medicine on staff at an Israeli hospital, delivering hundreds of babies, both Israelis and Palestinians. On January 16, 2009, in the midst of the Gaza-Israeli conflict, an Israeli tank fired two mortar shells into his home in Gaza. Three of his daughters were killed along with his niece. This is a picture of his daughters who died. During the conflict between Gaza and Israel, he was serving as a Palestinian doctor in an Israeli hospital. He would take the cab when he was allowed to leave the, the refugee camp or allowed to leave Gaza. He'd take the cab to the hospital and he worked for peace. He was somebody who was trying to build bridges and work for peace. He came home that day just after the attack on his home and he was a correspondent for the Israeli television station in Jerusalem, and so he was reporting from inside Gaza during the war. And, uh, and when he got home, he called the anchor at the television station, hoping that, it, that the anchor could send ambulances or somehow help him in Gaza because the ambulances weren't coming in from Israel. And, and it's recorded, it was, it was news time, and, and they, they had, the anchor was on the news listening to this phone call, and you can hear, I, I was gonna play it for you, and it's just too hard to listen to. You can find it online if you wanna look. And he's crying out and screaming as he finds one of his daughters had been decapitated, another one was dead lying there in a pool of blood, and a, and a third one was dead. And just crying, just screaming, the agony of a father. And what did he do about it? We decided that he was not going to allow his daughter's death, deaths to move him to hate, but instead that he had to make their lives count by working even harder for peace. He said this in his speech here at Church of the Resurrection. He said, we cannot allow tragedy and death and pain to be the end of our lives. I want to honor my daughters by turning this tragedy into a blessing. We must work for justice, but with what? A bullet? That's the instrument of the weak. No, with kindness, we will work for justice and for peace. He wrote a book called, I Shall Not Hate, A Gaza Doctor's Journey on the Road to Peace and Human Dignity. And though he is a Muslim, I will tell you he's far more of a Christian than many Christians that I know. He practices now in Toronto. He's on the faculty of the university there as well. But here's what struck me. If a Palestinian can do this with Israelis who killed his family, can Republicans and Democrats come together, conservatives and liberals come together in order to work for peace? And surely if that's ever gonna happen, it's gonna happen in the church. And that's what Jesus is calling us to in this prayer. And that leads to the last line that Jesus officially gave, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, somewhere along the way, I began thinking about this prayer, some of you have, and normally we pray it, and lead us not into temptation, as though God is going to lead us into temptation, we're begging God not to lead us into temptation. But James says that God doesn't lead his people into temptation. 
So we must not be praying that prayer right. The Pope recognized this recently in his book on the Lord's Prayer, but we've been talking about this for 30 years at Resurrection. When I was in seminary, somebody said the comma is in the wrong place. It's not and lead us not, comma, into temptation. It's and lead us, comma, not into temptation the way I want to lead myself, but deliver us from evil. And so at Resurrection, you'll never hear us pray it and lead us not into temptation. We always pray it and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so what we're praying when we get to the end of the prayer is lead us, God. Lead me today, lead me every day. Lead me, not in the way that I tend to go into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I wanna say just a word about temptation. This is a, a part of the hu universal human condition. If you're online, you can't necessarily see this, but in the giant stained glass window up here on the left-hand side, there is the first, the primordial story, the first story in the Bible is the story of Adam and Eve tempted to eat the forbidden fruit and the serpent whispering in their ear, did God really tell you that the fruit was bad? No, it's not bad, it's good for you. You're gonna want to have this kind of fruit. Right? And that story isn't about two people who lived thousands of years ago. It's about us. It's about our human condition. And so we tend to lead ourselves into temptation, but we're asking him, lead us not into temptation. You pray this prayer not on Sundays only, but every single day during the week. And you can understand why the early church prayed it three times a day. In morning, noon, and afternoon, lead us not into temptation. We need it three times a day. Here's what I know in this room, and those of you who are joining us online, there are some of you who are struggling with some serious temptation right now. We all struggle with temptation. I'll tell you three times during the ministry, during the time I've been senior pastor at Church of the Resurrection, there was a temptation that could have wrecked my ministry if I had taken two more steps in the, in the wrong direction. And I'm pretty sure that's true for most of you, somehow. I mean, I've, I've had staff members I had to let go because they were stealing money from the petty cash fund, you know, from the children's Sunday school offering. But somehow they thought that that made sense to them. And certainly in Kansas City, Three of the largest churches in Kansas City have lost their pastors over the last 10 years due to moral failure when they had an affair with somebody who was a parishioner or someone on staff. It's just a part of the human condition, but the question is, what do we do about it? And are we praying for God to lead us, and are we remembering what the consequences might be? Because what I find, I've asked people, I've had people in my office who had, you know, lay people who had struggled, and I just said, what, what were you thinking? But the thing is, you, can't, you don't think about all the consequences, and so part of what I'm gonna invite you to do is if you're struggling right now, you're in one of those places where I was three different times in ministry, and fortunately, you know, talk to my wife and say, hey, this is not a good situation, and she, you know, she's like, hey, let's work together and make sure nothing bad happens here. You know, but, but had I not done that, and, and so, you know, part of what we're doing is, and I'm asking you to do right now, is just to say, maybe tonight before you go to bed, what are all the consequences if you do the thing that you've been thinking about? Walter Wangeren, who wrote a book called As For Me and My House, he was a Lutheran pastor in, I think, uh, Minneapolis, maybe Detroit, it was Detroit, uh, talked about the moment of the maybe. And he said, you know, we all have the moment of the maybe where we play with an idea. We're not really gonna do it, but we just think about, it. what would it be like if I did do this thing, whatever it might be? And when we start playing with the moment of the maybe, it's not very far to yes. And so our goal is to stay as far away from that line instead of get as close as we can and hope we never cross it. Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The word evil, poneris, is a word that uh, doesn't, it can mean, it's, it's got the article before it, so it's the evil. And so some people say the evil one, but the word one is not there, the evil, which can mean just the bad, or the painful, or the hurtful, or the thing that destroys. So lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil, or the evil one, the moral wrong, the thing that will hurt me or hurt other people. And the last thing I'll mention about this is, again, we're praying lead us, so of course that has a personal dimension, but it has a corporate dimension. And in what ways are we together in danger of being tempted to do the thing that's wrong or hurtful or painful? 90% of the people in Germany during World War II called themselves Christians. How were six million people, Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and others, how were six million people put to death in the camps when 90% of the population called themselves Christians. Did you know in Rwanda, you know in the summer, 100 days, where we don't know even now, maybe a million people, 800,000 people were killed, hacked to death by their neighbors? Do you know that 85% of the population are Christians in Rwanda? How did that happen? How did Martin Luther and the German Christians of his day, leading the Protestant Reformation, write such horrible things about the Jews, that it maybe would be okay to take away their property and to burn their synagogues. Martin Luther wrote that. 
It's just that sometimes we can't see what we can't see. We're so caught up in a culture and in a, in a society that we're blinded to the fact that the things that we're doing don't actually look like the kingdom of God. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The line was added later. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't originally in the prayer, but by the end of the first century, certainly by the, uh, well, by the end of the first century, so Matthew's gospel, the earliest versions don't have it. By the end of the first century with the Didache, it is a part of this. It was common after a, after a prayer or a blessing to add a doxology. And this doxology comes from Second Chronicles. It's something that, that David first said, Second Chronicles 29, 11. So a couple things I want us to notice. Once more, when we get to the thine is the kingdom for me, I, I remember I emphasize thine, not mine. Thine is the kingdom, not mine. Thine is the power, not mine. Thine is the glory, not mine. You see, my natural tendency is I want the power and I want the glory and I want my will. I want it to be my kingdom. And you're that way too. And, and, and sanctification is in part, you know, surrendering more and more of ourselves to God. And the way that happens is when we pray this often enough, it begins to form our hearts. Remember the, the folks who can't even remember their names? but they remember the Lord's Prayer. When you pray this prayer every day, it begins to sink into your heart and it shapes who you are as a human being. Thine and not mine. Again, Will Williman and uh, Stanley Howross at Duke write these words. Here come politics again. One more time as we end our attempt to pray as Jesus taught us. And they note that the Lord's Prayer, particularly this line, is I love this, a pledge of allegiance to a king and his kingdom that throws throws all our allegiances into crisis. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. All right, I want to end with one last story. So some of you know Jeff Hansen's story. I had Jeff speak at Leadership Institute a few years ago. I think it was an interview uh, that we did. We filmed in advance. His artwork was here. Uh, We gave you a little piece of his art. And, uh, but I want to remind you of his story. Jeff um, was one of the most remarkable human beings that I have ever known. As a child, he was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis type one. These are tumors that develop in the brain. They're not cancer, but they are tumors that will ultimately destroy. He had one on his optic chiasmic uh, nerve, and so it left him visually impaired. By the time he was six, seven years old, he couldn't see the things the other kids could see, and the parents didn't understand this until one day they asked him what he saw when he looked up at the stars. What do you think about the stars? He said, I I can't see the stars, Dad. And they realized he would, took him to the doctor, he would never see the stars the way they did. It was like he looked through cheesecloth when he looked at things. He He was legally blind. And he loved to paint, though. And he started painting these little watercolors that he just gave to his mom and dad and other people, like kids do when they're seven, eight, nine years old. They put them on the refrigerator. And then one day he decided he wanted to make note cards and he wanted to have a, a bake sale out in his front yard. And his mom is a great cook. She's an amazing baker. And so she baked things and he sold note cards and, and uh, they had the baked goods out there. And this started a whole new trajectory for his life. His mom and dad weren't sure what was going to happen with this little boy who would always need their help for the rest of his life. Jeff told his story, uh, or his story was told on CBS Sunday morning. He was named uh, People Magazine Hero Among Us. His uh, paintings moved from watercolor to acrylic, and they began being purchased by people like Elton John, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Warren Buffett, and many others. I want you to hear a little bit of his story, and then I want to complete the story, tell you the rest of the story. Take a listen. He was formally diagnosed probably around age six, and we discovered that he had a tumor that was damaging his optic nerves. And brain tumors are a common feature of neurofibromatosis. And that resulted in him being treated with chemotherapy and radiation. We were devastated. Jeff's our only child. But we slowly learned to to live with it. And um, Jeff still remained the happy-go-lucky child. As a father of a child, you have this dream bank and you know, you, you think, okay, um, yeah, you're gonna be the smartest kid in the class, you're gonna be the quarterback of the football team, you're going to Harvard, and you're going to become an astronaut. Your dreams slowly slip away as you see, okay, you're visually impaired, okay, you can't drive a car, okay, you have learning disabilities. By age 12, I didn't really even see how Jeff was going to find meaningful work. Following radiation and chemotherapy, Jeff expressed to us that he had this desire to give back. He wanted to sell his hand-painted watercolor note cards at the foot of our driveway. I really prayed about that and thought about what gift do I have that I could offer to this formula, and that is baking. So I went to work, and he would sit there 
with his visual impairment and hand paint watercolor note cards. And I would just keep bringing the baked goods out to the bake sale. And at the end of that summer, Jeff had a grand total of $15,000 to gift to the Children's Tumor Foundation for neural fibromatosis research. And he was invited by his ophthalmologist, Dr. Trudy Gren, to take one of his hand-painted note cards and take that artwork and put it onto a canvas. And again, I thought, are you kidding me? I've, I've never even bought a canvas. But off to Hobby Lobby we went and purchased a canvas and it just happened. It was God's plan, but it also, the blessing was in God's plan that we as Jeff Hansen's parents, we were listening. We were listening and we responded to the challenge that was put before us. In seven years from that point, we quit our jobs and started working for Jeff and his art business. At the eve of his 20th birthday, we announced that he had given a million dollars to charity and I was sitting there going, this is the kid I had no more dreams for. Jeff was bound and determined to never be defined as the low vision kid down the street who had a brain tumor. Jeff wanted to be defined as the kid who gave a million dollars to charity. And he just really finds it incredibly fun to see the response to his art and to see, um, to you know, hear stories of what the money will do for that for that particular foundation. So Jeff says it like this, it's, it's not the challenge, but rather your response to the challenge that defines you. Jeff has sort of core belief, core belief. Mm -hmm. and it, it goes like this, every act of kindness helps create kinder communities, more compassionate nations, and a better world for all, even one painting at a time. And that's why he just keeps giving them away. It's the joy of giving. Last year at the age of 27, his tumors came back and would finally claim his life. The last time I visited Jeff at his home, I stepped into his room and he hadn't spoken in three days and he couldn't open his eyes anymore. But he was sitting up in a chair and his way of letting you know that he was still with you was he would raise his eyebrow even if he couldn't open his eyes. Jeff, it's Pastor Adam. I just came to say hey today. His eyebrow went up a little bit. And I took his hand and I asked his mom and dad, I said, let's just talk about his life for a little while. Tell me all the great adventures you had. And while Jeff could listen, his mom and dad recounted all of these adventures, going to Elton John's home, and what it was like to you know, have his, you know, have his uh, work talked about by Warren Buffett in his annual report, and what it was like to be able to give these paintings away to help other people who were in need, and all these great adventures he'd had, and what a great life in his 27 years. And finally, we came to the end, and I took the anointing oil, and I anointed his head in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I took his hands, and they each touched a leg or a hand, and, and we prayed, and we gave Jeff to Jesus. And then at the end of that prayer, I said, and now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, and for the first time in three days, Jeff spoke, and he prayed the Lord's Prayer with us, and you could barely hear it. And those would be the last words that Jeff would ever pray or say or speak. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, when Jeff was 20 years old and he reached his first million, he set a new goal, and his goal was by the age of 30 to give away $10 million. He didn't make it to 30, he made it to 27, and he gave away $7.1 million in his short life to help other people who were in need, to provide for their daily bread, to help the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. If a blind kid can do that, what can you do? What can your people do? What can your church do when you live this prayer? So here's my invitation. I have two invitations for you tonight. 
The first is to consider making the Lord's Prayer a daily practice in your life. Now, put a little note card somewhere where you just go, don't forget to pray the Lord's Prayer today and to pray it every day. Now, for me, I pray it every day, somewhere during the day, sometimes more than once, but, but uh, I've learned I take prayer walks, and I'll take it, and I take each phrase, and I unpack the phrase with a lot of the stuff that's in the book that you have, and I've found that I can pray this prayer. It'll take me sometimes 45 minutes or an hour to pray the Lord's Prayer as I unpack every little piece of it and yield myself to Christ. And here's a second invitation for you. I want to encourage you to consider using this in your own, I don't care whether you use my book or not, but I want to encourage you to consider thinking about having a series of sermons in your congregation, a series of small group studies, a series of Sunday school lesson in children's Sunday school, youth Sunday school, so that everybody in your congregation is learning about each phrase of the Lord's Prayer every week, and by the time you're done, they have a deeper understanding of what this prayer means and understand how it's meant to shape their life, their faith, and the world. And when you do that, I think you will have brought your congregation together. You will have deepened their faith. You'll have helped new people come to faith in Christ. And the world will be changed. So we're going to close this session. We've got amazing things coming up over the next couple days. But I thought we'd just start with some basic spiritual stuff tonight. And, uh, and, and we're going to close this session by singing the Lord's Prayer. And this is an old version. It came from the 1970s, I think. It might have come out of the Catholic Renewal Movement. And we're going to line it out for you. So one of our song leaders will sing a line, and then you'll respond with that same line. And I'm going to invite you to stand as we make this our prayer. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed. My goodness, <laughs> what an inspiring session. Oh, man, I just, I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> um, I'm Ashley Morgan Kirk. And I'm Tino Herrera. And we get to hang out with you this three days, and we are super excited about that. Um, you know, we each took something from that, from that session. So 
Tina, what did you take? Well, uh, you know, as always, uh, James and Jeff's stories are always inspiring and just uh, encouraging. You know, I had the opportunity to meet Jeff when I first got out here about four years ago. A tremendous individual. And then I still see James every Sunday morning, you know, and Adam's right. You know, he, he'll put the love sign up there. And so uh, just always good to see him and just to, just to see him and hear his story again. That's awesome. Well, as we go from this place tonight, we have a couple of things that we want to share with you. So just hang tight as we share those things. So the platform that we chose for this conference is designed so that you can not only engage in content, but so that you can also connect with our sponsors and with other attendees. You guys have already killed it at doing this. So to do this, be sure to jump in at the Whova website or use the app. 8.30 in the morning, Central Time, tomorrow to make sure that you hit our sponsor and community engagement time. That'll come on before the first session that begins at 9. Also, plan to visit our sponsor exhibit pages and check out their information and sign up to attend the live showcase with the sponsor representative. I hear several have giveaways, so be sure to get in on that fun. Yes. And if you want to connect with individuals who are also attending online, you can check out that community board and it will offer private messaging. Um, I already got a private message. It was really fun. Discussion threads, groups through meetups. You can also even schedule your own meetup about whatever you'd like. Hmm. So a few minutes before nine tomorrow, navigate to the Thursday agenda page to view the live general session. If you need technical assistance during the conference, uh, please make sure to call 913-544-0233. Or you can email at sharechurchconferences at core.org. All right, one last thing before we close. What is your one thing that Mm. piqued your curiosity or the thing that you're taking home tonight? Think of that one thing, maybe scribble it down for reflection later, or even mention it to a colleague so that you can start that conversation for deeper learning. And can we just say, we are super glad that you are here. Amen. So rest well tonight, and we will see you for an exciting day tomorrow. God bless.